I'm Scott Schaefer. Welcome to KQED Newsroom. And I'm Tui Vu. The waters off the coast of Monterey are home to otters, seals, sea lions, and whales, among other creatures. Next week, those creatures will be featured in Big Blue Live, a television special spanning three nights here on KQED. PBS and the BBC are producing the special, which will air live beginning at 8 o'clock Monday. Big Blue Live will focus on the comeback of Monterey Bay, where decades ago, dozens of species of sea life were on the verge of extinction. Although many of those species are now thriving, ocean waters throughout the world are facing a new threat. Coral reefs like these, vibrant and teeming with life, may hold clues to the future of the world's oceans. Coral reefs only make up a fraction of 1% of, of the ocean, but they hold 25% of the ocean's species. Not only that, but they feed hundreds of millions of people, and a billion people or more get some income from coral reefs. So this is an ecosystem that is really fundamental to, to humans on the planet. Steve Palumbi is the director of Stanford University's Hopkins Marine Station. He studied coral reefs around the world. For decades, warming ocean waters have damaged, even killed coral, but Palumbi says reefs are now facing an insidious threat from a chemical change that is making ocean water more acidic. Ocean acidification affects the entire globe's ocean, and it affects organisms by reducing their growth rate and by making it more difficult to, to make shells. We know that fish actually react to dangers differently. With ocean surface waters now 30% more acidic than they were two centuries ago, protecting the reefs from acidification is no easy task. It's not a problem you can just turn around very quickly. It's a problem that once it gets really bad enough so that it is having an incredible global effect, there's nothing you can do about it. You have to stop it before that point. The increase in acidity is largely the result of people burning coal, oil, and other fossil fuels. That pumps massive amounts of carbon dioxide into the atmosphere, which then sinks into the ocean waters at a rate of 9 billion tons per year. The carbon dioxide robs the oceans of an essential element that corals and other animals need to thrive. Corals make skeletons. Uh, that's the white part of a, of a coral reef. And those skeletons are made of calcium carbonate. Calcium carbonate tends to dissolve if the, the acid level in water gets gets too high. This model shows how the ocean chemistry has changed since 1885 and how it is expected to change over the next 80 years. The blue represents ocean conditions good for shell and coral growth. The orange represents conditions that make it difficult for many animals to grow shells or skeletons. There's a few of them right here. Most of them might be deeper. Jim Barry is a senior scientist at the Monterey Bay Aquarium Research Institute. He's looking at the effects of ocean acidification on a variety of sea life, including deep sea coral. The ocean critters out here are faced with a faster and larger change in ocean chemistry than they've seen for 30 to maybe 300 million years through much of their evolutionary history. Barry says if one species suffers, an entire food web can suffer. We could just measure this motility yeah, rate, but I... Barry and researcher Charles Bach are studying how ocean acidification thought, affects abalone, specifically whether it interferes with the ability of the shellfish to reproduce. Inside a chili lab, Bach is inducing female abalones to spawn. Each female releases streams of small green eggs through its respiratory holes. An abalone can spawn tens of thousands of eggs at a time. In one tank are the females, in another, the males. What you're seeing is puffs of cloud, white streams that are the sperm being released. Bach and Barry are putting the eggs and sperm together in water with varying levels of acidity to examine how it affects fertilization. Maybe what we saw in the last experiment where fertilization was lower in low pH, maybe it's because the sperm aren't swimming as fast. Their research suggests that ocean acidification significantly reduces the abalone's fertilization rate. Abalone are an important source of food for sea otters, who in turn help keep kelp forests in balance. We know that ocean acidification is huge. This is a, one of the biggest things that happened to this earth 
in the last many tens of millions of years. It's a huge environmental change that's happening right in front of us. Terry Sawyer runs Hog Island, an oyster farm on Tamales Bay, 30 miles north of San Francisco. And this is uh, a big Pacific oyster. This is how big they will get. Sawyer says ocean acidification is already affecting his business. It's really scary. It's a very scary place to be. The wake-up call for him came in 2005. That's when there were massive die-offs at oyster farms along the Oregon and Washington coasts. Those farms supplied Sawyer and many other shellfish farmers with the seeds and larvae they needed to grow their oysters. The larvae was completely dying and their seed was completely dying. It's not a way to run a business. Sawyer says he's concerned not only for his business, but for all the animals who live in or depend on the oceans. Feels like we're in the position being the canary in the coal mine. Um, the thing is, is I'm holding the canary. And so <laughs> I've got a responsibility to say, well, all right, we have symptoms here that, you know, that, that animal just died. Okay, what are we going to do now? Sawyer and researchers from the University of California, Davis, are now monitoring the water quality in real time. Purple line is pH. The data helps Sawyer and other oyster farmers in the area adjust planting schedules. To prepare for changing conditions, Hog Island is building its own hatchery. But Sawyer knows if conditions become untenable, he can always move. But that's the last thing I would want to do. A large oyster hatchery has already moved to Hawaii, leaving the more caustic waters of the Pacific Northwest. That's great for that, that hatchery, but what does it mean for all the animals that are already living there? They can't move. Jim Barry fears it may already be too late to save coral reefs. He points out that four of the last five big extinctions on Earth included ocean acidification. Are we going to see a mass extinction of things in the ocean? Boy, I hope not. No matter what we do, it, we don't, we're not going to see a recovery from it for very long periods of time. So it's going to be millions of years. The creatures that live under the ocean um, are some of the most magical creatures you can, you can ever see. And, and every single one of them seems like just such a stunning and unexpected success. I can't accept if my kids can't see that or my grandkids. Scientists say it is unclear if ocean acidification has reached a tipping point. Some people think we might be 80 years from being there. Now is probably the last generation where we can actually change the trajectory. I really hate to, to be able to only tell my grandchildren about it and not show it to them. I, I would hate if this is the last generation that the magical ocean exists. And joining us now to discuss the health of the oceans and the lessons to be learned from Monterey Bay area are Paul Rogers, managing editor of KQED Science Unit and environment writer for the San Jose Mercury News. Dr. Emily Rivest, UC Davis Bodega Marine Laboratory. And Paul Michel, superintendent of the Monterey Bay National Marine Sanctuary. Thank you all for being here. Emily, let's begin with you. What can be done about ocean acidification? If we want to get at the cause of ocean acidification, we need to reduce or ultimately eliminate our uh, emissions of carbon dioxide. Carbon dioxide is what dissolves into the surface waters of the ocean and causes the chemical changes that we're seeing. But there's a lot more than that. Um, the carbon dioxide problem in the atmosphere is a global problem. But for communities, local communities like those in Monterey Bay, like those in Tamales Bay we saw with the Hog Island um, Oyster Company in the package. They want to be, they care about the, the local marine ecosystem to them and what can they do about it? They can't necessarily control the carbon dioxide emissions of the entire planet. But we can think about the health of these local systems like the immune system of the human body. Now we're entering into the fall, um, we're entering into the flu season and we might want to start taking vitamins, sleeping better, um, all these things we can do to bolster the resilience of our own health. So in case we get exposed to the flu virus, the consequences of that will be minimized. So what can uh, animals in the ocean do to kind of become more resilient? 
Well, what we can do to buffer the health of our local marine ecosystems is we can reduce local sources of stress for these animals. We can um, reduce overfishing, we can reduce nutrient pollution, we can um, reduce uh, human-caused damage related to tourism. So, for example, um, in the coral reef example, humans stepping on corals, uh, touching corals, things like that. Um, and, and in that way, we can really try to maximize, buffer the health of these systems. Paul, Michelle, to, uh, um, getting to Monterey Bay, what are some of the challenges facing Monterey Bay? I mean, we know that it's had an amazing recovery, but what are the, some of the challenges it's facing now still? Well, ocean acidification is a big one. And I, but like the video says, there's this delayed response. So the impacts that we're seeing today were actually from pollution from 30 years ago. So even if we stopped the carbon emissions today, we're gonna see this lag effect. So, but that's a big problem. Locally in Monterey Bay, we've got some serious issues with water quality in certain areas, uh, shipping and fishing gear impacts to marine mammals, especially whales. Uh, big cargo ships that transit the area, they occasionally and unintentionally hit whales. We've had about 10 whales that were struck and killed in the last 15 years uh, in the sanctuary. Uh, we've got numerous entanglements from fishing gear in whales. Uh, over about 100 whales have been entangled just in the last 15 years as well. So these are issues that we're trying to tackle uh, that are big problems that require uh, responses from a lot of different agencies and stakeholders. Paul Rogers, uh, in many ways, this is a success story, what's happened with Monterey Bay. Uh, and I'm wondering, what are the lessons? What, what are we learning from what has happened since uh, this National Marine Sanctuary was declared? It's, mm -hmm. it's been very positive, so what's, what are the takeaways? Well, so many environmental stories are negative, right? You pick up the newspaper, you turn on the TV, it seems like the sky's always falling. And one of the things about the Central Coast, and, and I think this is the reason that we're seeing an international TV event uh, uh, from BBC and PBS focusing on this place, is that it is such a big success story. And basically, if you look at where we were decades ago, it's amazing. I mean, in the 1800s and right up to 1971, there was whale hunting off the Central Coast. I mean, there was a whaling station in Richmond that killed whales to make dog food. That was in 1971. Well, not to mention Canary Row as well, well and all that's the pollution that came from that. We had overfishing and all through the 30s and 40s, you know, 20 giant stinking, clanking canneries that Steinbeck made famous. We uh, hunted uh, the sea otters and elephant seals down to the last few dozen. Mm. And I actually thought sea otters were extinct at one point off the of California the coast into the 1930s. Um, and we had a Standard Oil Company wanting to build a giant refinery right at Moss Landing, where the Monterey Bay Aquarium Research Institute is now. That was narrowly defeated after the Board of Supervisors voted three to two in 1965 to approve it. And we had President Reagan and his Interior Secretary, James Watt, trying to put offshore oil rigs off the Big Sur and San Mateo coast. So to see this marvelously protected marine area with a lot of the wildlife coming back, the whales, uh, gray whales delisted, humpback whales coming off the endangered list, DDT banned, so the pelicans are back. It shows what is possible when you have federal government, state government, and local activism. You can save these places. How long mm -hmm. did it take before we started seeing some of these reversals of the decline in species? Well, a lot of it uh, started right after the early 70s. First, it was federal laws, right? It was the Marine Mammal Protection Act in the early 70s. It was the Endangered Species Act, the Clean Water Act, the Marine Sanctuaries Act. A lot of federal policies actually put into place by President Nixon, who it turns out was one of the most environmental presidents in American history. So those kind of things started the ball rolling. Then there were state and local efforts. And when President Bush Sr., who was trying to win California in the 1992 election and uh, created much larger boundaries for this sanctuary, basically from the Golden Gate Bridge to Hearst Castle, much larger than locals expected at the time, that then put in place uh, uh, folks like Paul and his staff who were able to do a lot more monitoring. We've seen expansion of scientific research, more than 20 scientific facilities around the Bay, 2,000 scientists, you know, 200 million plus in payroll. We have learned in Monterey Bay that you can make more money studying whales than hunting whales. Emily and Paul, uh, Michelle, and, and how much of what Paul Rogers has discussed also has to do with location, the location of where this wonderful, beautiful bay is located because yeah. you've got world-class research institutions here. You've got a fair number of supporters in Silicon Valley. In fact, David Packard, mm -hmm. co-founder of Hewlett Packard, funded uh, largely Monterey Bay Aquarium. Well, there's never been a better time for the marine scientists and ocean educators. There, there's so much more attention now on the, on the ocean and the bay. 
Um, you know, we talk to ocean scientists and filmmakers from all over the world that travel to incredible places. And more often than not, they say, gosh, I wish I'd have been here 50 to 100 years ago to see what this place really looked like. Well, that's not the case in Monterey. They come to Monterey because it is rebounded so remarkably. Uh, but that is, like Paul said, it's, to, it's due to the state and federal and local regulations, stakeholders, the scientists that have come together um, to make this a really special place. And, and yet we're still seeing acidification. We're sure. seeing, I mean, ocean temperatures yeah. are rising. So I'm just wondering, in spite of all these, all this great news, yeah. what are some of the stresses that are still being felt by the animals that are in, in this part of uh, the coast? So yeah. certainly uh, with ocean acidification, it doesn't discriminate. It's going to affect all of these, um, all of this rich, productive marine life that is in Monterey Bay. And one of the unique things about Monterey Bay, one of the reasons why it's so special and so productive is that it's an area with a really strong upwelling, which is this event that happens in the ocean during the summer where deep, nutrient-rich, um, more acidic ocean water comes up um, into the shallow coastal region and it and it's uh, produces this this vibrant, productive um, ecosystem that's so special. That's why all of these um, whales and marine mammals and feeders um, come to that area. Um, but as a result of that, because of this, this upwelling, this area also is exposed to more acidic conditions naturally, and that makes it a really unique um, opportunity to study um, what the effects of ocean acidification might be because we are already seeing those more acidic waters there. So what species are faring well? Which ones are particularly struggling um, with acidification? And, and can some of the fish alter their chemistry to accommodate the changing seas? That's a really great question. Um, as I mentioned, ocean acidification doesn't discriminate, but certainly there are um, certain types of, of animals that can better cope with changing chemistry than others. And the really vulnerable animals are the ones um, like abalone, like oysters, like mussels, also really tiny creatures that live uh, in the in the surface waters themselves, like pteropods, really small swimming marine snails that um, don't have as much of an ability to um, regulate their own body conditions and, and protect their own calcification, for example, um, against the effects of ocean acidification. And the effects on those animals are going to um, have consequences for these very charismatic marine mammals that are featured in Big Blue Live, like the, the sea lions, the dolphins, the whales, because they're part of the food web. They've, they're uh, really important uh, prey species for a lot of these um, larger animals. And, uh, to what, and are they able to adapt at all? We are trying to see if, if that's possible. The uh, chemistry of the ocean is changing extremely quickly, and that might outpace um, the capacity for these species to adapt to those conditions. But a lot of the work um, that we're involved with, and also Steve Palumbi, who is featured in the video, um, is trying to look at whether some of these marine invertebrates, like sea urchins, um, will be able to adapt. Paul, uh, yeah. the uh, president uh, earlier this year expanded the boundaries of the Monterey Bay Marine Sanctuary uh, that President uh, Clinton put in place. Mm -hmm. It seems to be working really well. So why don't we just declare all of the ocean off the coast of the United States a sanctuary? Why not do that? Well, why not? I mean, <laughs> sanctuaries actually are really about good governance. Um, we don't, for example, we don't directly regulate fishing, but we work with the fishing industry. We work with the councils to address issues that do come up. And really what we do is we try to bring people together to solve the problems. Uh, that is our role. It's our role also to study and to share with the public these amazing places. So um, I don't see why not. Um, I'll tell you why not. How does the sanctuary I'll, work? I'll, I'll yeah. tell you why not. Yeah. It's because oil industry, the oil industry wants to drill for oil yeah. off a lot of these places. Yeah. In Southern California, we have had oil drilling for more than 100 years, right? So um, when you put in place a national marine sanctuary, it bans oil drilling forever. So uh, Obama, as you mentioned, through administrative actions, expanded the two sanctuaries to the north of Monterey, the, the Gulf of the Farallons and the Cordell Bank Sanctuary, which are mostly off the Marine Coast, he extended them about 50 miles up to basically the Mendocino County line. That's something that environmentalists have been fighting for since the 1970s. Mm. And, you know, we've had Republican Congresses who have blocked attempts and who actually uh, have, have tried to get more 
oil drilling. You remember drill, baby, drill. It wasn't that long <laughs> yeah. ago that the, that the 08 uh, Palin uh, ticket was arguing that. And so it, there, is, there are billions of dollars in resources that people want to e extract uh, off of these places. So it's, it's just like national parks. When you, when you protect something, you're limiting other things. Well, that's what I was doing. Like, other than oil and gas, like, are there, so to speak, losers uh, when you declare a marine sanctuary? Well, I'll argue a little bit with Paul on this because in the Gulf of Mexico, there's no place that's more drilled for oil than the Gulf of Mexico. We have two marine sanctuaries, Flower Garden Banks and Florida Keys at either end of that Gulf. And right now, there's a site nomination process that's going on nationally where communities across the country are nominating their special place for consideration for one day becoming a marine sanctuary. We're seeing a lot of interest in the Gulf of Mexico. So we might be able to get to a place where we can have both coexist. What does John Boehner possible. think about that? Is yeah, he out there? Think... <laughs> <laughs> Paul, Paul he'll, is he'll shaking. Yeah. The two I mean, Pauls these, are going these, at these, it. These Paul Rogers is shaking his head. Decisions. And, and I mean, I think what's amazing about Monterey is that up until Monterey, it was common in California for politicians to push for more offshore drilling, right? I mean, it, we've had uh, go, gubernatorial candidates like Dan Lundgren who were pushing for more drilling. And basically, it has since become the third rail uh, of California environmental politics. Nobody argues anymore for more offshore drilling. It's something where you had this political coalition of tourism leaders, fishing leaders, enviros, you know, Silicon Valley types, and basically there aren't enough people on the other side. But when you're talking about places like Texas and Louisiana, where the oil industry has a lot more power, um, it's a different equation. This is really a basic question, but yeah. what does the sanctuary do? I mean, what, what does it prohibit? What does it limit? What does it restrict? So we, we deal with all those things that aren't fisheries related. So we deal with discharges to the marine environment, to disturbing the seafloor. You cannot disturb the seafloor. So the laying of cable or infrastructure or mining activities do not occur in the sanctuary. So we deal a lot with water quality issues and some of the activities that like wildlife disturbance issues that we, that we address. One of, the things, one of the things that Paul yeah, does so yeah. well in, in, with his team is they also shine a light on these places. Because if you think about it, before the marine sanctuary was established in 92, to learn about a lot of this stuff, you had to be a scuba diver or you had to be a marine scientist. And so when we had David Packard write the $50 million check in 1984 to open the aquarium, and when we had the marine sanctuary and then the sanctuary visitor center that opened in Santa Cruz, you're, you're, you're bringing this place to millions of people. You're inspiring them to see what's underneath the ocean. And you're most hoping you're raising seen. awareness to protect it. That's the point. Right. Yeah, most people have never seen a, cor a, a, a kelp forest. Sure. They wouldn't unless you had these places. And you can Paul, now, nowadays robots could go down too. You don't yeah. have to, right? Absolutely. And, and Paul, I wanted to ask you about another topic as well. Uh, the algae blooms. We're seeing a huge algae bloom off the coast. And algae blooms aren't unusual, but it seems like this year was unusual is that several algae blooms have merged and so we have this huge blob now. <laughs> What's causing it and uh, what kind of dangers does it present? A Emily can speak better to this, but essentially the water right now in the northern Pacific Ocean is the, w the warmest that it's ever been. Um, it's, there's an area actually called the blob and we don't think it's necessarily related to climate change or El Nino. El Nino warm waters are fur further south off the coast of Peru on the equator and that's quite likely going to bring a lot of rain this winter, we hope. Um, but the warmer wind waters are six, seven degrees Fahrenheit warmer than the historic norm, and that is driving a lot of this. Some of it has to do with changes in wind patterns that is affecting the upwelling, like Emily mentioned. Um, but in terms of how bad it is, what does it mean? Um, I'll defer to you. So these um, algae blooms have been particularly dramatic since about May of this year. But the blob has been in existence for almost two years now. Mm. And certainly in, in Bodega Bay, we've seen um, consequences of that in our local ecosystem. We're seeing some tropical species, even in these tiny plankton um, in, the, in the surface ocean. Um, and why is that? Do they produce a, a toxin? I had read that it can cause amnesia, right? The smaller shellfish consume it, and then birds consume the shellfish, and it causes amnesia. Mm -hmm. I don't know particularly about amnesia, but these um, giant algal blooms often contain types of algae that produce um, toxins. And these algae are consumed by um, 
filter feeders like mussels, for example, that are then consumed by animals like sea lions. And this toxin is transferred up the food chain into uh, marine mammals. And we've been seeing a lot of strandings of marine mammals this year because of this large algal bloom. And in fact, researchers at the Monterey Bay Aquarium Institute have documented such high concentrations of this toxin in the water, it's almost unprecedented. Paul, Michelle, what do you see, uh, as other than things we've already talked about, yeah. what do you see as some of the emerging threats to the ocean especially here off the coast of California? Well, I think as more attention is drawn to this Serengeti of the sea, we're gonna see so many more people wanna come here and experience it firsthand. Uh, you, know, you look at a place like Florida Keys where it's almost loved to death, mm -hmm. right? So their problem is very different. They're dealing with a lot of human use in the marine environment. I think we're gonna see, and then we're gonna be challenged by more uh, issues around wildlife disturbance. We want people to come and enjoy wildlife, but we don't want them to be harassed. Um, I think water quality is going to continue to be a big one. We're dealing now with desal. Desal, we could do a whole show just on desal. Um, and, but that has potentially huge impacts if you do open ocean intake with all the entrainment and entrapment of the marine organisms and filters that bring water in to be uh, desalinated. So we're working with communities to do a better job of designing these facilities to be less impactful. But as California dries up, the demand on the ocean for that water is going to increase. And, and speaking of uh, California drying up, and uh, we've heard you know some relief may be coming, right, in the form of El Nino. We've been reading a lot about that. Um, what does that mean, Paul Rogers, for California? Um, California is, as we all know, in the fourth year of the worst drought ever recorded in its history back to statehood. And um, El Ninos normally don't um, mean any uh, higher percentage chance for rainfall, but w the stronger they are, and by that I mean the warmer the water is compared to history, the better chances you have. So we're already in a strong El Nino where the water is basically 1.5 degrees uh, centigrade higher than the historic average. It's going uh, to maybe to be the warmest of all time in the next month or two. In, since 1950, we've had five examples where the water's been that warm. Four of the five, we've had much wetter than normal years in Northern California. So fingers crossed. All right, we'll keep an eye on that for sure. Well, thank you all very much, uh, Paul, uh, em, uh, Paul Michelle from the Monterey Bay National Marine Sanctuary, Emily Rivest from UC Davis, Paul Rogers from KQED and the San Jose Mercury News. Thank you all very much. Thank you. Pleasure thank you. having all of you. And you can watch Big Blue Live next Monday through Wednesday night. The show will air live from 8 to 9 p.m. right here on KQED. For more on the show and for our news coverage, go to our website, kqed.org. I'm Tui Vu. I'm Scott Schaefer. Thanks for joining us.